Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Eric Corum, founder of AIM7. Welcome back to The Blueprint, where we distill cutting-edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your busy lifestyle and goals. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Sachin Panda, a leading expert in circadian rhythm research and a professor at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. He's authored several amazing books, including The Circadian Code and The Circadian Diabetes Code, and he is one of the world-leading authorities on the subject. Panda's lab discovered that confining caloric consumption to an 8 to 12 hour period, as people did like a century ago, might stave off high cholesterol, diabetes, and obesity. He is the person that essentially coined the term time restricted feeding. And his lab researches the impact of time restricted feeding for preventing and better managing age related chronic diseases. And they research how people can extend their life and promote healthy aging. His lab also discovered the essential function of a blue light sensitive protein melanopsin in regulating our circadian clock, sleep, and alertness. And this is fueling a new lighting revolution to enrich our exposure to blue light during the daytime and reduce blue light at night to improve mood, alertness, and sleep. Dr. Panda is joining me for an amazing four-part series. And today we discuss in digestible detail what our circadian rhythm is, how it's regulated, behaviors you can engage in to keep it synchronized. And we also begin a fascinating discussion on melatonin that we will finish in a later episode. This is a rich conversation. So now let's lean in and learn from the best. Sachin, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. I'd like to start with just a broad overview of what is a circadian rhythm? What are the primary anchors for it? And how does this impact daily living? Yeah, so circadian literally means about a day. So these rhythms are daily rhythms. And scientifically speaking, uh, circadian rhythms are the internal timetable that are present in every cell and in every organ, including our brain. And these timetables, just like our timetables tells us when we should be doing what, these timetables tells every cell, every organ to do the right thing at the right time. So that means turning on hundreds of genes in different time of the day in the right organs. So then the question is, what does it do? What what do these rhythms do for us? So these activities, these timed activities, essentially improve our immune function, optimize our inflammation level and immune uh, response so that we can effectively fight infectious disease and get back to normal. Similarly, these rhythms also accelerate repair functions. So when you're injured or in daily activities, when there is regular wear and tear, then we can get back to normal. Uh, performance the next day. These rhythms also optimize our brain function so that we can be at our peak emotional performance, intellectual performance, and they supercharge our metabolism, detoxification, DNA repair, all of this that optimize our metabolism, optimize repair function so that we are protected from cancer, from metabolic disease and chronic disease, ranging from pre-diabetes, diabetes to cancer, or even dementia. So uh, these timetables are essentially built into our body. Then the question is why we should care about it. Because for the last 200,000 years, since humans have been on this planet, these rhythms were in sync with our day-night cycle. And there was not much concern about these rhythms. They were tied to the day-night cycle. But then over the last... I would say last 50 years, these rhythms have been disrupted. So this is where what is important to know is what daily activities we can do at the right time so that we can nurture these very primordial rhythms that are designed to keep us healthy. It's amazing. Like this one rhythm, it's a huge process, impacts every single cell of our body, every single thing that we would think is important. So with this idea in mind that we can leverage this to optimize performance, could we start with maybe cognitive performance? Because at the end of the day, it, it kind of everything kind of goes back to feeling good. And for those of us that, you know, we're kind of in a knowledge worker economy now, being focused and productive and creative is really important. 
can we leverage this in a way so that we can, I don't want to say, maybe even unlock more of our potential? Yeah, so you hit the right point. Is the brain controls everything in our body, in addition to cognitive performance, they also control function of different organs. So if we focus on brain, that's a good kind of anchor point to begin. So when we say circadian rhythms, most people will immediately think of sleep and wakefulness. We can also relate to jet lag. So that means when we travel to a different time zone, our brain remembers the old time. Now the question is why these rhythms are important, so important to brain. So brain cells, just like any other cells, they also need to repair, reset, and rejuvenate. Because every day when we use our brain, when we're solving a problem, or even if when we're talking, when we're just doing daily activities, interacting with people, and even navigating our regular world, our brain cells are firing, they're producing a lot of good things, they're also producing some byproducts which are not so good, they need to be cleared up every night. And that's what happens in our sleep, in our deep sleep. Scientists have recently figured out that there is detoxification of brain. That means all the unwanted materials that are produced during cognitive uh, activities throughout the day, they're literally taken out through what we call glymphatic system. It's like the drainage system from the brain and they're cleared out. So the toxins are cleared out. Then the second is a brain is composed of millions of neurons or nerve cells. And we know that nerve cells talk to each other and that talking to each other is the basis for our memory, our motor coordination, our cognition, everything. And every night in our sleep, these nerve cells, they strengthen the connection with each other. They also try to store in memory what we learned that day. And that way, sleep is that important to restore, to repair and rejuvenate our brain. The brain also is the master regulator for almost every hormone in our body. For example, just after a few minutes of getting into sleep, our brain starts to produce growth hormone. It also produces many other hormones that directly or indirectly affect our body. So the bottom line is, your brain may be acting at peak performance in the morning, but if your body is not ready, then you may not be feeling well. So that's why another role of circadian rhythm in brain is to produce this hormone, starting from thyroid producing hormone, gonadotropin releasing hormone, lots of hormones that are produced from base of the brain called hypothalamus and go to the pituitary and then they signal different part of the uh, part of the body. And also night hormone, for example, melatonin. That's, that's a good one. Let's yeah. talk about that. I know you have a, a very unique expertise in this area because of some of the research you've done. I would love to understand a little bit more about the role and the function of melatonin and then if there are ways that we can naturally boost the production of it. How is our current light set up impacting what should be these natural rises and fall in melatonin? And then what do you think about supplementation? So I hit you with three big ones, but I, I, I really want to dig into this. Yeah. Let's be, begin with uh, what is melatonin. Melatonin, many of your listeners must know that melatonin is a night hormone. It usually rises around our sleep time and remains high throughout the night and Maybe a little bit after we wake up, the melatonin levels go down. And this correlation between melatonin and our sleep prompted scientists to think that melatonin is a sleep hormone. Uh, and in fact, we know that people who take exogenous melatonin, melatonin helps them to fall back to sleep. So now if we think of melatonin, melatonin is, now we know, is the night hormone and sleep hormone. So that means for an average person, throughout the day, melatonin level is pretty low, almost undetectable level. And then around two to three hours before our habitual bedtime. So that means if you're going to bed every day, say between 10 and 10.30 p.m., then around eight o'clock or 7.30 or eight, that's when melatonin levels begin to rise 
to detect a level. And then by the time... Is there a signal for this? Or is it just one, two to three hours before your regular bedtime that you're in this rhythm, the body knows? Like, is there a, something that kicks this off? It's believed that melatonin is one hormone in our body that's almost entirely regulated by our circadian clock mm-hmm. and by light. So that means if we're in a dimly lit environment, suppose say in the evening, if you go home and there is a little bit 40 watts light bulbs in your living room or kitchen room, and then you're just watching a little bit of TV, not the full bright setting, or if you're in a candlelight dinner, your body clock, the circadian clock, will actually tell your pineal gland to produce melatonin roughly two hours before sleep time. We should also keep in mind there are a lot of people for whom the melatonin levels begin to rise around sleep time. Okay. And as you said, what are the other things that affect melatonin? Uh, We also know that bright light, particularly blue spectrum of light, which is rich in blue enriched light, LED light. If you want to know what would be a good example of blue enriched LED light, if you walk into any grocery store or pharmacy in the U.S., that light level, very bright light level. It's almost disturbing. Yeah, that's very effective in reducing your melatonin. That's like 1,000 lux of light. So that means if you have one lux of light is roughly lighting a candle and keeping it one arm length away from your eyes. And typically, five to 10 lux of light. So that means in a room, if you have a candlelight, nice dinner, and if you light it up five to 10 candles in the room, that's not going to affect your melatonin level that much. Your brain will think that it's night and it will begin to, the clock will kick in and will start melatonin production two to three hours before bedtime. Now, if you crank it up 100 fold, so that's 1,000 lux of light, and that's what you're seeing in grocery store and, and drugstore, that's pretty bright light, and that will slam the brick on melatonin. So mm. melatonin will not begin to rise anymore until unless you're completely outside that bright light environment. And it's not only that amount of light, even if you're looking at your iPad or any tablet at full brightness, and when you're looking at it, Typically, your tablet is, say, one or two feet away from your eyes, but that amount of light is also strong enough to affect your melatonin level. Mm -hmm. So that led to the idea that dimming down your brightness and your screen and kind of maintaining a dim light environment where you have, say, 40 watt light bulb, which are orange shifted, which kind of look like candlelight uh, color light, you can actually buy those lights in any stores. Uh, So those are better than full-blown bright LED blue light. I want to pause for just a second to let you know that the AIM 7 beta app is here and our early members are loving it. AIM 7 turns your wearable data into actionable recommendations to improve your physical and mental health. No more wasted time trying to figure out what your data means. With AIM 7, you'll have exactly what you need to make the changes that you desire, and they'll be available right at your fingertips. We are now letting in a limited number of people for small cohorts. So if you want to reserve your spot, sign up now at aim7.com. You can find the link in the show notes and you'll get access to our beta app, four Zoom calls with me to discuss habit building, adaptive capacity, and so much more. You also get access to our exclusive Facebook community. So sign up now and make sure that you know in the sign up that you are a Blueprint Podcast listener and we will prioritize your registration. So this begs the question, if we want to aid our body in natural production, if when the sun goes down, we need to start dimming the lights. Yeah. We need to help our kids. I have three boys. Uh, so we want to help our children with this too. So start dimming the lights around the house. So they start feeling like it's getting close to nighttime. Their body starts doing what it's supposed to do and it's regarding melatonin production. I know you've done some fascinating research in melanopsin. I got to ask the question, like, What about these blue light blocking glasses? What do you think about that? Yeah, so when we said blue light blocking, we got to know how much of blue light they're blocking. Okay. And whether it's effective or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are many blue light blocking glasses which block maybe five to 10% of blue light. 
mm. but that may not be enough. Like, for example, if you're wearing a blue light blocker that blocks only 10% of blue light, and if you're walking into a grocery store in the evening, then <laughs> effectively it's bringing that blue light or whatever light level is there by 10%, but it's not making a dent. Whereas if you're wearing kind of a goofy looking red or orange or yellow glasses, which really looks goofy, they actually <laughs> block a lot of blue light. And those So I'm assuming you don't wear these. I don't wear this, but at the same time, I also avoid to go to grocery store or, or drugstore at night. So and if you're in your home yeah. and you're just dimming the lights down, you control the brightness on your TV and your iPad or whatever you have, and, it start, and you can put it in night mode, night shift modes, whatever, you're pretty much taking care of business. Yeah, in most cases. I mean, that's why I say that just like you put an alarm clock to wake up in the morning, maybe we can program our devices to nudge us to go to bed. And mm -hmm. one of the nudging aspect is set all your phone, tablets, PCs, and even in some cases now, some of the new TVs can be programmed to dim down and maybe change the spectra to night shift mode. It's not like they're going to make us fall asleep right away, but it's <laughs> not that, hey, it's nine o'clock. You better yeah. wind down now and get ready to go to sleep. And in fact, many new version of uh, control system for your lighting, you can program them, uh, that will happen. And you can program almost every light in your house. But for most people, the best thing is, when you're going to replace any light bulb in your house, just be mindful, except for your bathroom. In most other places, you can actually get away with dim light bulbs, like 40 watt light bulbs. For bathroom, it's a different story. You can put bright light, but put a dimmer so that in the evening you dim it down. Because in the morning, you need bright light. And if you cannot go outside, outdoor right away, or if you're living in a cold northern latitude to north, and you don't have enough access to light in the morning, so that's when you crank it up to full brightness. So I said that just like alarm clocks have to wake you up, similarly, managing light in the evening, dimming down, is a way to nudge your body to go to sleep. I love the practicality of this. Like you're living in the real world. Sometimes you talk to folks, I talk to people about different subjects, and you're like, this is not practical. This is incredibly practical. Now, what do you think about melatonin supplementation? Melatonin is a very interesting hormone because we know that almost every animal produces melatonin, whether it's day active or night active. It usually correlates with nighttime, so nighttime melatonin goes up. And in humans, as we know, melatonin can make people fall asleep. So now let's go back to melatonin and how it acts. We still don't know clearly how melatonin make us fall asleep. But if we think of three different types of problems people have about sleep, um, three major problems, one is difficulty falling asleep. You may be tired, your brain is cranky, and you don't have any desire to work or think or work on any project. You want to go to bed, you get into the bed, and you cannot fall asleep. Second is fragmented sleep. You can get into sleep, but after an hour or two, you wake up, and in every one or two hours, or maybe every three to four hours, you're waking up, and it's difficult for you to fall asleep again. And then the third one is insufficient sleep. You might have slept for seven or eight hours a night, but in the morning when you wake up, you feel like you haven't had enough sleep. So these are three major sleep problems people report. And typically, melatonin helps you fall asleep a little bit faster. So that's why, you know, once you get into sleep, most people will think that once they get into sleep, they can wing it, they can go through the night. So that's why a lot of people try to take melatonin. So now the question is how much melatonin one should take, when to take, what kind of melatonin. The reality is when we take melatonin, exogenous melatonin, a good chunk of it, some estimate is nearly 90 to 95% of it is cleared by our liver and kidney within 15 to 30 minutes of taking that melatonin. Mm. So that means 
the suppose say 30 minutes before your target bedtime you took melatonin by the time you are going to bed nearly 90 percent of it is almost gone that's okay it means um, if it helps you to fall asleep that's fine and studies have shown that melatonin can help people to reduce this what we call sleep latency so that means when you go to bed and when you really fall asleep so that time reduces by 7 to 12 minutes so that means it may be easier to fall asleep but there is no good data showing that it actually helps you with fragmented sleep people who can go to sleep and they're waking up it may not help hmm. so that's where some manufacturers have come up with slow release mel- melatonin because they realize that okay so big time release yeah on, so time release melatonin so slowly it's kind of dripping melatonin. is that gonna prevent you know my question is if this is something that's supposed to be generated from the pineal gland are we now inhibiting melatonin production is there any data on that that by exogenous supplementation that now we're dampening what our brain should be doing so it's very difficult to say because you have to level both at least the exogenous uh, melatonin and measure total melatonin and since melatonin is a night hormone that means you have to measure it in every half an hour or one hour throughout the night it's very difficult so the experiment is you bring people, put them into some inpatient clinic, they're sleeping, but they have a blood line catheter going, <laughs> that long line is going to the outside of the room, and the nurse is drawing blood every one hour, 20 minutes throughout the night. So the, so the person who is drawing blood is essentially sleep deprived, and it may not be even comfortable for this person. And to get good amount of data, you also need at least a dozen people, male and female, and ideally more at different stages, young, old, etc. So it's a very difficult experiment mm-hmm. to do. So that's why these experiments have not been done repeatedly in multiple locations. So, but few things we can keep in mind. So in the morning, melatonin levels usually drop. And if you're not using an alarm clock and you have gone through seven to eight hours of sleep and you are not on exogenous melatonin, your natural melatonin level begins to drop maybe half an hour before you wake up, but it goes to baseline or undetectable level. That can take an hour or two, Mm. even in the presence of bright light. There are some really nice, elegant studies done on healthy volunteers and blood was taken in every... 30 minutes on an hour, throughout 24 hours, in control condition, uh, and they found that it takes somewhere between, again, 30 minutes to two hours for your melatonin levels to go down to baseline. But if you're waking up with an alarm clock, typically one hour before your habitual wake-up time, suppose say you really need eight hours of sleep, but if you're you are going to bed around 11, so that means you should be waking up at seven or later. And that's when you feel fully rested, so your melatonin levels should have gone down. Mm -hmm. But due to work, you are waking up at six o'clock in the morning, so that means your melatonin level is still at pretty high level, and it will take a little longer for that melatonin levels to go down. Mm. So now the question becomes, okay, so why I'm talking too much about (laughs) No. It was being high before and after going to bed because that that's where this new twist to melatonin story comes in. That's Sorry, super. No, this is interesting. So if we were to tie a bow on this yeah. to help people kind of, I mean, there. I just love the fact that folks like yourself are really digging in this because we're in a culture that's sleep deprived. We're yeah. depriving ourselves with our devices and all sorts of different things now that are part of our lives. You would say, hey, I'm just going to regurgitate this back to you. You know, make sure that we're controlling light so that our brains can do what they're supposed to do. If you are going to do this, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but you just need to understand that a lot of this is metabolized before it even starts to work. There is, an, you know, we don't really know the long term effects because these studies are really difficult to do. Would it be wise to make sure that we're taking care of our environmental factors and other behavioral factors first? Clear all of that out before somebody would consider this? 
Yeah, and another thing is we don't know how much melatonin our brain actually needs because mm. I have seen people who can take half a milligram of melatonin and that will knock them down. They will feel <laughs> super sleepy and they can sleep right away. And then I have seen people who need 10 milligram of melatonin and it doesn't do a thing. So the point is your sensitivity to melatonin is very personal, personalized, should be personalized. And it's very difficult to go and pick a bottle of melatonin from grocery store these days even, not even drugstore, and uh, start popping that pill. Because in most cases, melatonin that's sold in the US is now three to five milligram. Some cases I've even seen 10 milligram melatonin. And who knows how regulated this is? I mean, it's yeah, not regulated, exactly. but it, we don't even know if it's, well, most of these supplements aren't batch tested. It's just a roll of the dice. Thanks again for listening to the Blueprint Podcast. And if you enjoyed today's episode with Dr. Panda, we've got three more coming. I am so excited to bring these to you. Also, if you love the show and you've been listening for a while, would you please take a moment to just leave us a review on whichever listening platform you are joining us from, as this helps us reach more people with the message of the Blueprint. Thanks again for listening, and I'll catch you on the next episode.